So hello all. As introduced, my name is Sister Lucy Marie. I'm a Benedictine sister at St. Joseph Monastery in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So I entered the community in 2018, and I made my first vows on the Feast of St. Benedict in the summer of 2020. <coughs> so for some quick background on my community, we were founded in 1879 in Creston, Iowa, but we moved to Guthrie, Oklahoma in 1889. We began to run and teach school at schools across Oklahoma. In 1926, we founded Monica Casino School in Tulsa at the request of the bishop. In the 60s, the mother house was moved to its current location in Midtown Tulsa. So we currently have 13 sisters, with Sister Catherine being one of the other ones. And we serve outside the monastery in our school at Catholic Charities of Eastern Oklahoma and by our support of others in their faith journey through our Lexio Divina retreat, spiritual directions, and many other ministries. These ministries are an outward expression of our love and commitment to our communal prayer and life together as Benedictines, living under the rule of St. Benedict. But now to the real reason I was invited to speak to you all today, how I, born and raised in the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City, ended up in Tulsa as a Benedictine sister. So I was very much a cradle Catholic. I was baptized at St. John Nepomuk Parish in Yukon as an adorable little baby. <laughs> and having watched the video of the liturgy, I can reliably say that I cried for a very large portion of it. <laughs> My parents, Cliff and Mary Avis, are here with us today. And I have a little brother named Jack, who is four years younger and a solid foot taller than I am. I also was blessed that I grew up with a lot of my extended family living nearby, so I almost always was running around with a cousin or two or spending the night with them. Now, I went to Yukon Public Schools for kindergarten to eighth grade. I loved learning, mostly math and science, and I was a voracious reader of novels. But as you all know, we Catholics are a small percentage of the Oklahoma population, so most of my friends growing up weren't Catholic. They were from different faiths and backgrounds, but most of them were Christian. Since I was going to public school, my parents always made sure that my brother and I attended Sunday school at the parish each week. And if you know my parents, waking up the extra hour early on the weekend was quite the sacrifice. By the time I was in middle school, my parents were both deeply involved at the parish and made sure that Jack and I were also. We helped teach younger grades of Sunday school with mom we altar served as often as we could. And honestly, we just tagged along with our parents whenever they were doing anything at the parish. My parents made sure we knew that our faith was not just something we did on Sunday. It was an investment of time and service during the whole week. We were a part of the life of the parish. You know, in a lot of ways, I appreciate the fact that I went to a non-Catholic school at the time because it forced me to decide that I wanted to be Catholic. I had to take the time to pick pepperonis off of my pizza on Fridays during Lent, and I got to explain to my friends why I was going to church on a weird night of the week for a holy day of obligation. I mean, and my parents were very good in showing us what it meant to put that faith first. Um, if a soccer tournament I was in was playing on a Sunday, we went to mass on Saturday. If a soccer tournament was on the same weekend as a retreat for confirmation, we skipped the tournament because the retreat was what was more important. So when it came time to go to high school, my godmother and aunt, Nancy, asked my parents if they would consider sending me to Mount St. Mary's. She ran the Catholic Youth Summer Camp at Our Lady of Guadalupe for many, many years and had always heard a very good thing about, had heard good things about the school from her staff. After much discernment between me and my parents, we decided that I should go to the Mount for high school. Now I acknowledge that the Mount has been in the newspapers a lot lately, and I don't really want to comment on that. But I will say, for me personally, the Mount was an important part of my faith journey. At the Mount, I got to meet a sister for the first time. So Mount St. Mary's was founded by the Sisters of Mercy in 1903 and has been since co-governed by the sisters and the archdiocese. When I was there, there was still a sister teaching in the science department. 
And while I never had her as a chemistry teacher, just seeing her around opened up some new possibilities for me. Before that, I didn't realize that sisters were still like a thing you could be. <laughs> so, now we jump back to the parish. By the end of high school, my dad had begun formation to become a permanent deacon for the diocese. And my mom was also working at the parish office and would soon become the DRE. Part of my dad's formation process was that he attended pastoral ministry classes here at the pastoral center. I think practically like in this room, right? Even across the or, hall. Okay. Yeah, right. So these classes were organized by Sister Diane Corey, who's a sister of mercy. I decided as a senior in high school that I would attend these classes with my dad. We were not always the best students. Uh, we tended to pass notes during class. <laughs> <laughs> but they let me get to know Sister Diane better over the year. By the end of my senior year, I asked Sister Diane if I could start to come visit the sisters at their convent. This was when my discernment really first started. You will notice, however, that I am not a Sister of Mercy. While I value the education that the sisters gave me, and I will always carry a piece of mercy in my heart, their charism did not seem to be quite the right fit for me. So I went on to college. <laughs> I went to OU and I studied computer engineering. I think it's probably a small vestige of pride, but I do love to see people's reaction when they hear that I'm a nun with an engineering degree. But fun fact, the first woman in the United States who received a PhD in computer science was a Catholic sister. So while I was at OU, I was active at campus ministry at St. Thomas More. I began to attend daily mass as a freshman. I slowly began to take part in different ministries. And by the time I was a senior, I was on the campus ministry leadership team. I also ended up becoming friends with a few other women who were also discerning a call to the religious life. We started a women's discernment group since there was only one for men at the time. And we even did a nun run to Maryland and back over spring break. This group of women, especially my friend Laverta, were instrumental in my discernment. They were companions to walk along the journey together. Okay, so how did I meet the Benedictines? <laughs> one night, our discernment group was meeting, and one of the women who was from Tulsa happened to have seen on Facebook that the Benedictine sisters were having a discernment retreat in a few weekends. Six of us decided that it would be good for us to attend. So we all drove up to Tulsa with only one car getting lost, and we attended the sisters' monastic moment retreat. We got to experience the life of a Benedictine sister for the weekend, praying, working, recreating with the sisters. One of the jobs we were assigned was to clean the pews of the sisters' chapel at the monastery because Sister Maria Paula was about to make final vows. I decided I wanted to come to that too. So my parents and I drove up for the mass because I still didn't have a driver's license at the time. After that, I would probably come visit the sisters about every six months or so for the next three years. Finally, after much discernment, which I can go into detail in a second, I asked the sisters to begin the process of formal discernment with them. At that time, I had already graduated with my bachelor's degree in computer engineering, but was working on my master's. The sisters let me move in with them as a guest, but asked that I finish my degree uh, before entering formally. So for my final year of study, I lived in Tulsa, drove to Norman once a week to meet with my advisor, and I wrote my thesis. I graduated in 2018, and then formally entered the community a few months later as a postulant. In the dedication of my thesis, I said, there is nothing like having 20 women all asking, are you done yet, to help you finish <laughs> writing a paper. So now we're almost caught up to the present. I spent one year as a postulant in the community, one year as a novice, and then made temporary vows in the summer of 2020. Now I'm considered a scholastic sister, and I will have the opportunity to either renew my temporary vows or make final profession next summer. 
Since September of 2021, I have served at Catholic Charities of Eastern Oklahoma, which really is a wonderful organization. I was able to help with the resettlement effort of the 800 Afghan refugees that were settled into Tulsa and Stillwater. And now I am overseeing the implementation of a new inventory system to track the 10 million pounds of food that Catholic Charities of Eastern Oklahoma distributes each year. I would say up to this point, I have mostly talked about the externals, what I was doing, experiencing who I was with, but what about what was going on inside me, in my own heart? How was I growing in relationship with Christ so that I could make vows wholeheartedly to serve and love him unconditionally? I was thinking, I really do get asked a lot, how did you know you should become a sister? And in all honesty, it's still sort of a hard question to answer. I appreciate it. I had a sister look over this uh, talk. She's been in community for 73 years. And she said, I don't know how to answer it either. <laughs> that made me feel better. <laughs> so I guess I should say that I do think I do. I have an answer, but it's not the 30 second answer that most people are kind of looking for. I think the closest thing I have is more of the following idea. I realized I should become a Benedictine when I realized that God created me as, as a Benedictine from the very beginning. I mean, we all believe that God has a plan for us so that we can learn to love him and so be with him in eternity. The name of that path set before me by God is the Benedictine way of life. You know, a large part of my discernment was and is learning who I am and who God created me to be. And I discovered in my experience of beginning to live the Benedictine life that living as a Benedictine is what's going to bring my whole self into communion with Christ. So what does that discernment look like? So for me, it took a lot of reflection and a little bit of humility. As an example, so I mentioned that I grew up at St. John Nepomuk Parish in Yukon. Now my parents still live in the same house that they lived in when I was born. They still attend the same parish I was baptized in. In fact, it's the same parish that my great-grandparent Fitzmorris's attended. For me, it was a stable community. If my parents had a disagreement with someone at the parish, we didn't just leave. They had to learn to live with and love that parishioner. If we didn't agree with something the priest said, we didn't pick up and go to Mustang. It's hard to stay in a relationship with a parish for that long. But now, my dad gets to marry couples that he remembers when they were born. My mom has students attending RE that she taught their parents. So this was the family and the parish that I grew up in, and I absolutely love it. Nothing makes me happier than when I receive a note reminding me of their prayers from the Knights of Columbus in Yukon, because they are men that I have known for my whole life, and they are supporting their parish, and they support me, a child of that parish. I have watched some of the families at the parish grow old, generations die, but then the younger ones step up and take on new responsibilities. To me, this is what being a part of the church means. It resonates in my soul, and it calls me to be a part of Christ's body. I find that same calling in my community. As a Benedictine, I made vows of stability, obedience, and conversatio. My vow of stability means that I am vowing myself to seek God with and through my sisters. In all honesty, there are mornings when I wake up and I really hope I don't run into a specific sister on my way to the coffee pot. Uh, but our vow of stability makes us work through our differences, come to a new understanding, and grow closer to each other in God in the process. We vow to stick with it, to plant our feet firmly on the ground of our monastery, side by side, and to build it into a foretaste of God's kingdom. This struggle, this joy, is what brings us all deeper into Christ. 
So I mentioned that I also made a vow of conversatio. So conversatio usually translates from Latin as conver conversion by the monastic way of life. So one of my favorite parts of being a Benedictine is that it is ordinary. The idea of ordinary doesn't seem to spark a fire for most people. In fact, it seems like a lot of the vocation literature I see is to the effect of come live an extraordinary life, be a superhero for Christ. Benedictine literature is a little bit more like come and live an ordinary life and be a human fully dedicated to Christ. You know, the longest chapter of the rule of St. Benedict is dedicated to humility. And I don't think, and I know it's not a coincidence, that humility, humanity, and then humus or dirt all share the same root in Latin. We were created out of dirt in the image of God. Therefore, as we become closer to our humanity formed from the dirt, we become closer to being that image of God. Benedictine life is all about growing in our humility so that we can grow in our humanity. It is my joy to live an ordinary, fully human life because that means I am living as God created me to live in his image and his likeness. So our Benedictine prayer flows in the same manner. We pray the Psalms every day. The Psalms are some of the most human parts of the Bible. They run the whole gamut of human emotion, from praise and ecstasy to sadness and dejection, even to anger and hate. They teach us to be human in the presence of God and allow him to touch our brokenness and turn it towards him. We also pray Lexio Divina, or divine reading, we read and we pray with the scriptures. We allow them to speak to us, to form us, to shape us. We humble ourselves before the word and we allow it to teach us how to love him more and more. So I want to thank you for the work you are doing to support and foster vocations to the priesthood and consecrated life in the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. When I started to discern, it felt very isolating. There were posters up everywhere about priests and seminarians, but I felt very alone as a woman looking at the consecrated life. I find it amazing that there was a Benedictine monastery of women less than two hours from my hometown that I never heard about the entire time I grew up at the parish. In fact, one of the sisters, Sister Veronica, who just passed away, was from Yukon. And when I did hear about people talk about religious orders of women, they were usually heavily romanticized versions of consecrated life in communities far away. I honestly thought I could not be called to that life. And in fact, I wasn't. I was called to the very real life of a Benedictine at St. Joseph's. So thank you for inviting women religious to speak to you and to share their lives with you. Thank you for allowing us to tell our different stories and share our different experiences and charisms with you. And of course, thank you for all of your prayers for us who have and who are discerning this way of life. But now is your next opportunity do you want to see more religious sisters serving in Oklahoma? Then give an invitation to some women at your parish to come visit us in Tulsa. And I would humbly request that you pray and ask God who you might be able to extend that invitation to. God may be calling women that do not fit your expectations, but they are quietly and humbly seeking him. Pray for all women discerning their vocation. I want to conclude with a quote from the Rule of St. Benedict. It is from the end of the prologue of the Rule, and I think it's a pretty good summary of the Benedictine life. I received a wonderful icon of St. Benedict when I made vows, and it has part of this quote on it. So it's kind of my daily reminder of my call at the monastery. 
So I quote, Therefore, we intend to establish a school for the Lord's service. In drawing up its regulations, we hope to set down nothing harsh, nothing burdensome. The good of all concerned, however, may prompt us to a little strictness in order to amend faults and to safeguard love. Do not be daunted immediately by fear and run away from the road that leads to salvation. It is bound to be narrow at the outset. But as we progress in this way of life and, and, and in faith, we shall run on the path of God's commandments, our hearts overflowing with the inexpressible delight of love. Never swerving from his instructions then, but faithfully observing his teaching in the monastery until death, we shall, through patience, share in the sufferings of Christ, that we may deserve also to share in his kingdom. Amen. <laughs> so here you go. And so I one of the questions I asked uh, Sister uh, down in Norman, you know, as a as an engineer going into a monastery or in, into the monastic life, uh, as she did, uh, how did you carry along your college experience with you, and what impact did it have? And she thought she said. Uh, well, we have a lot faster Wi-Fi than we use. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but I'm sure you want to know more than that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sister? Yeah. Do you still keep up with your friends from college? I do a few of them. So I come back, um, especially now that novice year and pandemic is calming down. Um, so I get to come visit some. Um, I still have a few, especially from graduate school, that I kind of call like once a month but, so we can all kind of keep up. So, yeah. Um, some of the women from our from the discernment group, so a few entered and then discerned that religious life was not for them. Um, but uh, one in particular is still, uh, she's a servant of the Lord from Maryland, and uh, she's currently serving in Iceland as a missionary. So, <laughs> but yeah. Your paper on. <laughs> it's called uh, le learning assisted decoupled software pipelining. So, it, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, trying to make programs run faster on our computers <laughs> in smart ways. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed your comment about how you know um, in your discernment. Uh, there you were going to school in Yukon, and you weren't even aware that two hours away was a monastery that might be your future home, and that living there was a nun who was from your hometown. Yeah. Isn't that a reminder to all of us how um, we have resources, we have a, a history, we have a presence that uh, we need to be sharing with others around us uh, who may need to know the story. Uh, just to add to that, I remember when I was in grade school at St. Eugene, you know, we took field trips. Um, we took field trips to the Carmelite nuns in Oklahoma City and you know, they exposed us to those, to that. And I was just wondering, do, are the schools doing that now? Or are you saying they're not doing it? Or they're not doing it enough? or? Um, I would say at that time, of course, I wasn't going to Catholic school, so that may have made a change, but so I just, I didn't have that experience. I know in Tulsa, they do fifth grade vocation days. I thought you guys, you guys started doing that too. So I think that's just keep up the good work <laughs> like and keep trying to grow that because, um, yeah, I mean, if your only experience of religious life is the sound of music or the sister act, it's going to make it really hard to discern. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. At St. John's, they're not. At the Yukon, that I know of. I 
So it's just driving away. So uh, yeah. when you're young, did anyone ever approach you and just a mentor or someone from the parish that really saw something in you and had that one on one conversation with you to say, Have you ever thought about becoming a sister or because many of of the talks we've heard, there's been that one person or the ladies that sit at the front of the church yeah. that come up to a young man and, and say, We've been praying for you. You should become a priest. And, um, you know, exposure to the religious and the priesthood is great. Yeah. But I think, too, part of the catalyst for that happening is that one individual that approaches a young person and say, you know, you should really think about it. I, there's something that in your spirit. There's something that I see that could really benefit from you thinking about and discerning this. Not that it's going to happen, but that you should be open to the idea. Of yeah. I personally did not really have like that person. Once I started discerning, I kind of had other people that supported me on the journey. So my peers, um, some of the sisters I did meet, um, even things like, uh, so I worked at Our Lady of Guadalupe summer camp for five summers. So I was around a lot of the seminarians there um, and being able to see them living, starting to discern and living their call helped me, I think, um, to be able to be with other young people doing that. And it kind of, there was kind of a fostered sense of vocation there. Um, so that, that was really helpful. But, and then, but yeah, but now that I go back to the parish, I love one of my favorite stories <laughs> is uh, there's a woman who's kind of like the matriarch, one of the matriarchs at UConn. And so at UConn, we still pray uh, after mass for vocations like the Our Father Holy uh, Hail Mary and Glory be the whole time I was growing up. I think you still do it, yeah. right? So for a while they were printing that it was for priestly vocations. So one of the older women came up to me when I came home and she goes, I'm just letting you know, I know we're not supposed to, but I'm praying for women too. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so. There is, there's a really, really active one. They are fantastic. If you guys ever get to hook in with them, they, uh, yeah, we're actually about to have, we have um, the new seminarians for the diocese are staying at our monastery for their kind of two week boot camp to get ready for the seminary for the first time. And the Sarens are helping us uh, with meals and we're gonna all have a big dinner on Thursday. So it's gonna be fun. Speaking yeah. of that, you mentioned that you provide spiritual direction. What, what are the options for yeah. At your monastery for someone you want to come Thank you. My, come sis for my sisters would have killed me if I had forgotten to <laughs> put in that blurb. Yeah, so we have um, so we have the School of Lexio retreat, which happens three, four times a year. That's kind of, I think it's five days. That's a more kind of intense um, retreat to learn about Lexio. So we practice sustained Lexio, so it doesn't follow kind of the pattern most people are used to um, because we're praying a lot of Lexio every day. Um, so just to be able to share that spirituality. Um, but then we also, I mean, a lot of our sisters are trained spiritual directors, so um, people can call. The other nice thing is we have um, guest rooms. So if you're ever looking for a weekend of silence or you want a weekend away and to meet with a spiritual director, you're welcome to call us and come stay in one of our retreat rooms. We have more for women. We have one for men, um, if you're ever, and for couples, if you're interested. Actually, I brought brochures, so it's got all our contact information. If you want some or some for your parish, um, it's got vocation information, but then also has kind of some of the other things we offer. So I can. Thank you, sister. Is, yeah. is your life silent when you're not working? <laughs> we are not. So uh, <laughs> yeah, like vow. Like I don't actually, other than maybe Carth. No one takes a vow of silence, but some orders are more mm -hmm. silent than others. We're not as much. Um, uh, in the same way, we're not cloistered, re really, um, I mean, since we work outside the house. Um, but we are definitely uh, monastic. A lot of people will ask us, and I even use the term mother house because it's what people are used to, but for Benedictines, we don't really refer to it as a mother house. It's our monastery because we take vows to that place so we don't get sent other places. Um, our community life, it's that vow of stability. Bit. 
Sister, have, have, have you, uh, uh, is it, has it been encouraging that you have younger women who are now discerning uh, locations uh, to the Benedictine order? Yeah, it's really helpful. We actually, I, a couple months ago, got back from a big kind of, uh, so we're part of a monastic congregation of other Benedictine houses. And so the congregations sent all their younger sisters to go hang out together and uh, pray and just kind of be, that was really fun. <laughs> like, cause that, I was with other, um, a lot, quite a few other women my age. So it was, uh, it's just great to see the life. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for yeah. driving down I-40 for today. <laughs> <laughs> happy to. Not much traffic. Yeah. yeah. So happy to yeah. have you here for and, this talk. And thank you again for the invitation, and thank you for all of your all's work. This is one that will be definitely worth watching a second and third time. Thank you. Well, so, right. Thank well, you. Uh, Here, the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and, and to the Holy Spirit, Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. And with your Spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.